Hello and welcome to this episode of Essex by the Sea. I'm Owen Ward, exploring the Essex coast, finding out about the amazing and interesting stories it has to offer. Before meeting my guest, I'd really appreciate it if you would subscribe on your favourite podcast app. And don't forget to tell your friends about Essex by the Sea and encourage them to subscribe too. For this episode, we're going to find out about the rich maritime history of Malden. David Patience is a local author who also knows a thing or two about boat building, having been a shipwright for over 40 years. David, welcome to Essex by the Sea. Thank you very much, Owen. So how did Morden become the heart of, of the Essex maritime scene then? Well, I suppose because it's ahead of the river and the town of uh, Malden was a very important uh, town for distribution of uh, of wealth and uh, crops and industry from this area. So it had the surrounding Essex and particularly the agricultural um, wealth of the area, especially providing London. I suppose London became its its main shortest uh, trading partner. So yes, um, that encouraged the allied trades, shipbuilding, wharves, uh, ship owning, and, uh, and, and obviously a lot of farmers getting involved in the maritime pursuits because they had to ship their goods and uh, particularly hay and straw later on for the horses when uh, the, the metropolis had thousands and thousands of horses uh, and they had to be fed and uh, embedded and so they took hay and straw and of course, there was a, a, a great need for uh, bread, um, well, fruit for wheat, uh, and uh, flour was milled in Malden and areas, and a lot of the flour went to London. That would bring back, in fact, wheat and bricks and other things that they needed. So uh, you had a sort of cross trade between Kent, Suffolk, and uh, the city. I recently saw that a new uh, cargo route by barge was going to be started from uh, Tilbury Docks uh, over to, to one of the, the ports uh, over on the other side in Kent. Uh, and it sort of was uh, written up as though it was a, a new thing. But, you know, going back years and years and, and, and you know, this has been going on for, for almost centuries, isn't it? You know, the, the Essex coast really has been sort of the motorway of goods going to and from London. Yes, particularly. I mean, these new enterprises, uh, you know, one thinks it's a very good thing. But of course, the problems of transport now has all gone on the railways and on uh, on uh, the roads and the rivers, I'm afraid, are becoming less and less used. Although we have um, uh, at Felixstowe and Tilbury, we see the uh, tremendous amount of uh, traffic that goes in and out there. But that is, you're talking about thousands and thousands of tonnes not the sort of uh, a 35 tonne of hay and straw that was normally taken to London. You were um, a shipwright for, for quite a while uh, in, in the Morden area. Tell me, how, how did you get involved in, in that particular uh, job uh, when, when you were younger? Well, it was a, a complete change of events because I was a bit of a dunce at school and my, I went to art college and did a degree there and then did an art teacher's diploma. And while I was in London, uh, I used to go barging from age of 15, uh, going crewing on the barges in Malden, having lived on Canby Island, and it wasn't far away. And when I was at college uh, doing my art teacher's certificate, someone said to me, have you seen this, David? They want an art teacher at Malden Grammar School. And that was a bit of a disappointment because no art uh, student wants to get a job and I went, and because I was reluctant, I got it. And I remember walking down to Water Cook and Sons, the barge yard in the Morden, and the shipwrights were in the mud, and they looked up at me and said, you look a bit, what's the matter with you? You know, have you, you know, lost a half a crown or found sixpence? So I said, no, I've just got a job. Uh, and they laughed, uh, obviously, at that. And I left teaching. I took up a sort of an apprenticeship scheme, not an official one, with Water Cook and Son, with the local barge repairers there. From there, uh, I, I left and um, it may become an independent shipwright and, and developed a, a, a boatyard at Fallbridge, which is up near the bridge, you know, the top of the river. 
And what sort of size uh, boats were, were you making then? And, and sort of what, what were they made out of? Well, I, I went there to build a 32-foot yacht, which was a very uh, nice project, but you don't often get asked to build boats. Um, I joined the Curden Sailing Trust that uh, was established to take youngsters to sea and become their shipwright advisor. And so we had their ships to look after. And I gradually um, got a, a quite a, a few clients, especially from the charter trade, the sailing barges that were being uh, taken out of trade, cha- you know, from their motors and being re-rigged for the charter trade, which Morden became famous for. So that was my bread and butter work. I was going to say, we see still lots of barges around Morden <coughs> and the Essex coast, but, but obviously, you know, they're, they're not doing the jobs that they were originally uh, d- designed for. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the charter work now of, of sort of day trips and sailing trips, really, aren't they, uh, mostly? Yes, and of course, the, this COVID episode has made it terribly awkward for the companies that have built up a good clientele of, of people like going away for weekends or a day sailing or even further. And so um, Malden was the, as well as Kent, had the, the majority of the charter barges. And uh, while I was at Water Cook, what we were doing is uh, we'd been bought out of trade because they were under sail to begin with. And then the sails were taken off and engines were put in. And then the work was superseded by uh, motor ships and so they were bought up and re-rigged again for a new life and that gave him a completely second new life with them being re-rigged rebuilt uh, to take passengers rather than cargoes i guess that that must have been quite a bit of work actually to transfer the the usage of the the barges and the vessels from cargo carrying to passenger carrying yes because a lot of them have been worn out after you know, 50 or 60 mm. or more years of hard trading with grabs and loading stone and being pushed hard. Um, so there was a lot of repair work, obviously. And then uh, one had to take the wheelhouses off, uh, repair all the sailing gear, put new winches, all the things that were superfluous uh, as a motor barge, and uh, perhaps sometimes putting in new engines. And then the whole hold, which would be just swept clean, after the last cargo, had to be changed in for heads and for uh, a, a galley and for for, for um, accommodation. Mm-hmm. So that was another, the carpentry side of it was another busy scene. I think once we had a barge of uh, cooks that we were going to change to a sailing barge for charter work, and we took uh, spent a whole month getting it ready to re-rig and the company which was uh, in Ipswich decided them change their minds and turn it back into a grain carrying barge again so we took it back to and put the wheelhouse on and made it back into a motor barge again so um, there's a lot of work as you uh, as you imagined. Now uh, more recently you've written a, a book it's called One of Howard's. First of all who was Howard and, and why did you choose to write a book about him? Right. Um, while I was busy laying under a barge in the cold and wet driving spikes underneath, um, uh, it was a nice thing to have a hobby at home. And so research and writing was interesting. And when I was at Water Cook, the shipwrights that taught me were taught by shipwrights that were taught by John Howard, which was the very important shipyard in Bolton. The dates for him is... 1849 to 1915 and he was responsible for some of the most beautiful barges built uh, for the hay and straw trade to London and so because of my association be, knowing they'd been taught by John Howard by people by John Howard by John Howard as it were that I felt I was part of the link of apprenticeship schemes of uh, passing the knowledge and so I started to delve into his history and find newspaper reports. And a friend of mine supplied me with the modern newspapers. And then you can go online at the uh, National Newspaper Archive, which uh, is a marvellous um, source of information, and the Essex Records Office. And so for, what, 20 years, 
it was just a hobby. And then some silly sod said to me, you ought to write a book and then your problems start, of course. <laughs> and, and I guess, really, where, where do you begin once you've uh, sort of accumulated all that information and sort of, you know, uh, pulling it all together into to something that's then, then obviously an, an enjoyable read? And I've seen some reviews and, and certainly is that. Was there anything that you found surprising in your research when, when writing the book? Yes, I think so. I mean, the title is also A History of Shipbuilding in Malden. And I thought I'd better start from Doomsday or somewhere silly and see what was going on in Malden. And surprisingly, you know, from the, say, even the, from the 14th century onwards, there was a tremendous amount of work and, and boats being built. Not like, you know, not excessively like you would get in London or big build, shipbuilding areas, but a steady stream of very interesting craft leading up to John Howard. And uh, he being nearly the one of, of the last to build the sailing vessels that uh, applied their trades locally. So, yes, um, I learned a tremendous amount about uh, um, all the vessels that were built here, the, the characters, the shipwrights, the allied trades, the, uh, the farmers and the owners and the sail makers, etc. And, uh, of course, I had to fill in that. And um, my wife, who did some proofreading, said, oh, David, it's getting more interesting after chapter four. So I've recommended people start at chapter five. <laughs> the one to four is the history, to the build up, you know, why John Howard existed. The title obviously is one of Howard's. Why that title? It's slightly unusual. Well, yes, it, it's quite a simple one, because when I, even when I was uh, messing about with the old boys sailing, um, they used to say with great pride, especially if they come from Malden or come from Essex, that if they saw a barge that had been built for Howard, it was, they'd say, that's, that's one of ours, you know, mainly because he did a very distinctive, beautiful transom, a lot of scroll work, gold leaf, um, put a lot of stuff that he didn't get paid for into his barges. So uh, as Harvey Benham, who is a, was a local author said that he was far more of a artist than he was of a craftsman and it led to many a uh, lot of uh, money worries and bankruptcy finally it's interesting actually and and uh, it's just sort of struck me that yeah when you look at the old barges that that are still around and and, and pictures from from when they're in their prime there is actually a lot of art in it. You know, the, the, the shapes of the vessels for a start and, and you know, they're, they're even now picturesque. When you see, a, you know, a sailing barge off, off the uh, coast of Malden, you know, it, it is, uh, you know, to put it into to sort of today's language, uh, Instagrammable. And, and you, know, it, you know, it's it's a picture perfect scene when you see one in full sail. So uh, I suppose the shipwrights that would have been making them um, were, were artists in a way. Yes, I think so. They had a, a well. They had a great pride in what they were doing, and the governors, uh, um, especially if they were artists themselves, i.e., artisans, I suppose, enjoyed uh, drawing scroll work, enjoyed the decoration, which is minimal, but you know it is there, and making sure that the, the shear line is right and all the the shape is right, and also combined with it's got to do a job. Mm. It's got to load say 120 tons if it doesn't you know the owners will give it back to you but um I, there is other boat builders had to build a barge builder had to build so many i think one pundit from kent said that the brick barges which there's so many of were made by the marl and just chopped off every 80 foot to you know to <laughs> supply a tremendous demand for vessels to take um, building materials to london but yes, uh, you're right. They, everybody was involved and very proud of what they, they did. Well, David, where can we get hold of a, a copy of one of your books? Well, the um, retail price is £40. But for your uh, readers, oh, no, not readers, <laughs> your listeners, um, I'm doing them at £35. And if they need to be posted, I'll, I'll, although the postage has gone up, it will be posted for five pounds. So it's 40 pounds fully posted and in a nice um, box without damage. And I think the best way is for them to email me at david.patient 
with P-A-T-I-N-T at btinternet.com. And, uh, and thank people that if they can support me over this, um, I've still got a great pile to get rid of. And David's email address is in the information where you downloaded this podcast. Well, David, uh, I, you know, I hope uh, the books will be flying off the shelf now uh, that uh, people have heard it on Essex by the Sea. And, and thank you ever so much for, for joining me on uh, the episode. No, thank you very much. Next time on Essex by the Sea. We're following the trade winds, so we're following basically the route that Chris Columbus used when he discovered the Americas. So we're going from the Canary Islands to the Caribbean, uh, most likely Antigua, which is our, our current plan. Well, make sure you subscribe in the same place as you found this episode so that you don't miss it. An episode will land on the 1st and 15th of each month. Essex by the Sea can also be found across social media as well, so get liking and following on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. So until next time, thanks for listening. <laughs>